Um, introduced by um, our esteemed guest, Ms. Joan Morgan, soon to be Dr. Joan Morgan. <laughs> internationally as an expert on the topics of hip-hop and gender. So a perfect person to uh, moderate and present this panel today. Um, and she was our closing keynote last year. We had a discussion with her and um, Dr. Rick Cooper um, uh, about hip-hop feminism um, during the 15th anniversary of Chicken Heads. Um, and so today we'll have, yes, we'll have one that's running from her, literally from his flight to come here, so he'll join the panel when he gets here. Um, so he'll be last on the list. So I'm going to take it away. Oh, my God. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I am thrilled to be here talking about um, hip hop. New directions in hip hop and the um, the idea of exploring masculinity and gender and identity, um, mostly because uh, these are my folks and um, all of us have been doing this a really long time, and it's it's nice to sort of have a breath of between ten and twenty years now to sort of go back and revisit what it is we're looking at. So I'm going to introduce everybody really quickly. Um, to my immediate left is my uh, actual oldest friend in the world. We've been friends since we were three years old. That becomes necessary when I do the next thing that I do this so you have some context. Um, <laughs> so uh, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal is the professor of black popular culture in the Department of African and African American Studies at Duke University. He is the author of several books what the Music Said, Black Popular Music and Black Popular Culture, Soul Babies, Black Popular Culture, and the Post-Soul post Aesthetic, Songs of the Key of Black Life, A Rhythm and Blues Nation, New Black Man, Rethinking Black Masculinity, and Looking for Leroy, Legible Black Masculinities. Neil is also the co-editor co with Maury Foreman of That's the Joint, the Hip Hop Studies Reader, second edition, was in 2011. And he is also the creator and host of Left of Black web series. Let's give it up for more. And my other Mark. <laughs> Dr. Mark Lamont Hill is a distinguished professor of African American Studies at Morehouse College. He is one of the leading intellectual voices in the country. He is the host of HuffPost Live and BET News, as well as a political con contributor for CNN. Okay. And then we have Dr. Matina. <laughs> Let them know it's appreciated. <laughs> we have Dr. Matina Love, is an award winning author and associate professor of educational theory <coughs> and practice at the University of Georgia. She is also newly tenured. <laughs> Riley's bio, so when he comes in, he can just jump Can in. we add that she's a nice year Jones fellow at Harvard University? I'm really sorry. <laughs> so Harvard is going to be popping next year. <laughs> I hope Skip knows what he's gotten himself into. Uh, Dr. C. Riley Storton is an assistant professor of Black Queer Studies at Cornell University. Storm's research focuses on black cultural politics, theories of gender and transgender, and sexual epistemologies. Storm's first book, Nobody is Supposed to Know, Black Sexuality on the Down Low, traces the emergence and circulation of the down low in news and popular culture. And that is our <coughs> esteemed panel. Many 
months ago, um, Mark asked me if on, for the 10th anniversary edition for New Black Man, um, which is a seminal book, really, in the um, exploration of hip hop, um, black male identity and masculinity, Mark called and asked if I would uh, write the new forward. So as I usually do with Mark, I say yes, and then because I'm a grad student, I completely forgot that I said yes. <laughs> and then a publisher contacted me and said, you know your deadline is like tomorrow, and I was, oh, Mark is like, did I, did I say yes to this? He's like, you absolutely said yes. Um, and so I had to come up with something. Um, and so I wanted to write something that really, I thought about what does it mean for, have to, for this book to be in circulation for the last, 10 years, and how has it really impacted the way we think about um, masculinity and hip hop, and also um, black men and feminism, right? Can, can, can we have black male feminists? Which is a question that is kind of introduced um, in this text. So I'm gonna read the foreword, and then I'm gonna open up with, our, with my opening kind of framing question, and then each of you will speak, and we'll just have a combo after that, okay? Dearest man, which is what I call him, Mark Anthony Neal. Um, a book forward is an admittedly odd place for a confession, but the truth is that you and I have always seen New Black Man differently. A decade after its first printing, my issue has little to do with the book's intended purpose or its call for new and unflinchingly honest interrogations of black masculinity, patriarchy, heteronormativity, sexism, and gender relations. Contrary to a little something I wrote way back when, black men can't have too many feminist sensibilities. Not if we have any hope of surviving this not even mid-millennium mindfuck, delivered courtesy of the steady decline of the U.S. empire, the decimation of middle-class aspirations that undergirded the optimism of the post-civil rights generation, and the mass incarceration of black and brown bodies that rivaled the Jim Crow South not to mention the increased militarization of U.S. police forces, made even more deadly by a cultural ethos that not only criminalizes black bodies, but also tacitly sanctions displays of execution-style violence as if somehow this issue is really necessary in peacekeeping. By the hands of the police, vigilante, or other, every 20, hashtag every 28 hours, a black person is denied the ability to become new or anything else ever again. Ferguson is smoldering as I write this, and I can't lie to your brethren and dread out here to rise an America shame to no near enough. In its deeply introspective, prescient way, what new black men understood so beautifully back in 2005 is that the kind of progressive patriarchy it sometimes feels that our first black president is advocating for, bring back the daddies, pull up your pants, go to school, get jobs, and it'll all be all right, fails miserably against global black realities. The times call for a far more nuanced and sophisticated ish, not least among them strategies that refuse to ignore the critical import of creating healthy, sustainable gender paradigms that enable the whole cisgendered slash trans, queer, straight, male, fe female lot of us to work this thing on out together. It also understood that this process would be necessarily unending. Over the course of the decades since New Black Man's printing, you and I have had countless conversations, public and otherwise, questioning whether hip hop can still be considered viable as a critical lens and interrogating the ways digital technology has shifted the game for better and for worse. All the while taking note of the very far ways black feminist thought's new intellectual guard stays challenging its foundational tenets by mining relatively new theoretical terrains pleasure, affect theory, fashion, queer thought, art, and transnational and diaspora theory among them. All of this is to say, Mark, that the power of new black man for me has never been as a prescriptive. It is the book's ability to stand as a testament that the most important step in a feminist journey is, however brilliantly or imperfectly, to begin. For the many black men who have picked up this book since 2005, their journey began with these pages, which brings me back to the confession. My contention with New Black Men was never about content, but rather your understanding of its genesis. All praises and gratitude to the forces that conspired to 
deliver you to the great guiding spirit that is Alexis Mama Soul DeVoe. Props to them too for the triumvirate of Gloria, his wife, Misha and Camille, his two daughters. But you were becoming a new black man way before that. Glimpses of that man were evident in the kind, thoughtful, quiet, deeply reflective three-year-old that made room on a South Bronx stoop for a somewhat bossy, newly immigrated Jamaican princess <laughs> and invited her to sit, invited her into your vivid imaginary world of trains, travels, and daydreams. The same little dude whom, despite all conventional norms and wisdoms of our far less than gender progressive hood, allow her to grab your hand, claiming you fiercely and possessively as her very first and very best friend. That little boy keeps me company every time I read you, black men, reminding me that the grown man who consistently and seamlessly makes room for his fellow female scholars, artists, and comrades has always strived to be new. conversations um, now around hip-hop, particularly around masculinity and gender, um, about patriarchy, um, take on a romanticism of what the early scholarship or the early work was like, right? So hip-hop back in the day was a movement, now it's all jacked up. Hip-hop back in the day was conscious, now it, it's, it's completely apolitical. When really it was never like that, you know, there was a there was always a fair share of like party bullshit, which was fun, and in that fun was misogyny, even back back days. Um, and so all of you have done really groundbreaking work around gender and uh, masculinity and identity and and um, ideas of what a hip hop feminist womanhood could look like for our young people, and so. I just want you to each speak a little bit about your overview. Like, so what did you think when you started, and what do you think now? I got Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was already married um, and without children um, when I started grad school. I, I remember one of my uh, older mentors when I decided to go to the University of Buffalo telling me that I should work with Alexis DeVoe and, um, you know, she's not a segregationist. I, I didn't quite know what that meant <laughs> when she said it. Um, but, you know, Alexis DeVoe at that time was a science and now was a rather feminist. And she intuitively understood um, the value of having this hip-hop head, nappy-headed Negro from the Bronx to be into her interlocker um, and, and crafted a space for me to be at the one time, you know, be comfortable in the space of radical <coughs> black feminism, and at the same time, um, understand that I had privilege and what to do with that privilege. <laughs> the easy part of this travels has been to write about this. Um, essays, blog pieces, um, you know, this room that we're in right now is a safe space. Right? I can be as black male feminist as I want to. That's a whole other different deal sitting in the barbershop, you know, <laughs> when I'm in the chair and dudes cutting my hair. That's a whole other conversation, you know, in a room of, of other black men in which the only real privilege that we have are the privilege to be seen as, you know, hyper-masculine in the way that the black men are. Um, the real challenge for me to take the work from the pages, um, from the lectures, from the books, um, was when I had two daughters. Um, and you know, part of what the challenge is for me looking back on that, it shouldn't have taken two daughters for me to think about progressive gender politics. And, and ultimately what that meant initially was, you know, how do I raise them in a world, help to raise them in a world, in which um, they don't have to think that the fact that they are black and female um, makes them any less valuable. Um, but it also meant, you know, how do we 
raise them so that they can make choices in their lives in which they don't think that they necessarily need patriarchy in their life to find lives of value. Um, and, and all of the things that we see in popular culture goes against that. Um, you know, what does culture, popular culture, do to independent women in general, let alone, you know, independent black women? I often tell my daughters now that the most feminist thing that I can do for them now, you know, is when they graduate from college to give them a down payment on their first home. <laughs> uh, because what that will do is give them economic independence. And they will never have to choose to be in a relationship because of the comforts that come with that relationship. Um, they can make decisions based on their own independence and not on the idea that pairing with somebody somebody who might not be in their best interest helps them to survive economically or otherwise. Um, and, and so, you know, for me, the other, you know, change in all of this is that the easiest work that Mark and I can do, and I can think about, a, you know, a bunch of other men in this conversation, David Eichert, the, the Byron Hunts, Hertz, and I can just go on and on. You know, in this room, you know, we talk pro-feminist politics and, you know, we all get hugs and handshakes and, you know, in some places, you know, if, we, if I was single, I can't speak for Mark, probably some ass, um, you know, for having the right cut. <laughs> just, just, just being real about it, right? Just being real about it. Um, <laughs> that's the easiest part of it now. The real work that we have to do is, is with brothers. Right. And, and we can't go on it, you know, how do we get the cats who are on the corner to recognize the, the values of a progressive gender politics? And then we can't roll up on the corner talking about, well, dude, I'm a black male feminist, <laughs> and start the conversation there. I mean, I mean, part of what it is now is to look at what the lived realities of black life are. And what you will find is that there are black men, right, corner boys, who do in fact embrace, in various ways, forms of progressive gender politics. We need to find ways to affirm those activities without feeling the need to name them. Um, in the new introduction to New Black Men, I tell the story of seeing these three cats um, at this fish spot in Durham. It's two o'clock in the afternoon, they're getting a bunch of fish sandwiches. Um, you know, the, the bourgeois sense of myself is like, what are these dudes doing at two o'clock in the afternoon getting a fish sandwich? Um, you know, meanwhile, I'm at a red light driving home to have lunch to, to pick up my kids, right? And one of the things I, I started to think about is like, well, let me imagine a potential storyline for these three dudes, right? Two of the cats are out of work. One of them works, but he works a night shift, right? He works from four to midnight. He and his uh, baby mama are not together, but they have two kids. And even though they're not together, he's taking on the responsibility of parenting, right? So while his Former partner is at work, working a traditional nine to five, right? He works his four to 12 shift, right? Or rather, he works his 12 to eight shift, goes home, sleeps for four hours, and then he's the one who goes and picks up the kids. He picks up the kids, he takes them to his home, works with them for two or three hours on their homework until baby mama comes home, right? She takes, she takes over the kids, he goes home and gets his last four hours of nap, and then goes back to work. The two dudes who are with them are dudes that he's been hanging out with, and he's trying to pass on to them responsibility as parents, because they're in the same kind of situation. And you hear that narrative, and for some folks, it's like, yeah, we need to like stand up and like give that guy a hand clap of praise. But you know, more black men actually do that than we recognize, right? Those men aren't visible to us. Like when when Geraldo Rivera got upset at LeBron James for hands up, don't shoot t-shirts and saying that LeBron should have a t-shirt that says, be a father to your child. It's like, did you not see the Samsung commercial? <laughs> did you not see that commercial? <laughs> right? And he wasn't married to, to, to the woman yet, right? They, they were still like the baby daddy, baby mama mode, right? But, but he was being a responsible father. Black men do this every day. How do we affirm those behaviors and others without feeling the need to go, dude, that's progressive gender politics, right? That's black male feminists, right? And we need to create spaces in the culture to affirm that behavior. And it's going to take progressive men with progressive gender politics to be able to do that, kind of work, right? And that's the more important work now, I think, in, in my mind, than actually advocating on behalf of black feminist voices, because black feminists can advocate for themselves and have done effectively for like centuries.
I had to go get it, and most disturbingly rape. The rules of all of these games were essentially the same. Boys chased down girls, and after capturing them, dry humped them on the street, in an alley, or behind a car. These games provided some of our earliest introductions to heteropatriarchy and rape culture, teaching us that girls were things to be desired, pursued, and obtained for our own desires. Girls weren't allowed to chase the boys, and they certainly weren't allowed to like getting chased or caught, much less free. While the classroom notes allowed for more female agency than our street games, they were no less troublesome. Like our games, the notes position boys as natural perpetual pursuers of girls, and only girls, whose own desires were either insignificant or illegible. I cite you that. Girls could respond <laughs> yes, no, or maybe to our notes, but could never raise the same romantic questions in their notes to us. Although the notes created space to express our interest in having girls, there was no room to articulate deeper feelings of desire, longing, or vulnerability. These notes established and reflected the limits of the severely constrained emotional vocabulary that I spent the rest of my life struggling to expand. Like most men, I was taught the rules of male emotional engagement at an early age. Boys don't cry. Boys don't get sad. Boys don't feel. Any experience of hurt, fear, or disappointment had to be suppressed, ignored, or immediately converted into one legible male emotion, anger. To willfully engage any emotion other than anger was to, quote, act like a girl, and therefore be less like a man, violating the zero-sum rules of patriarchal masculinity. These rules have made the idea of literacy as emotional work both unimaginable and undesirable for men and boys. While girls are often urged to journal their feelings and share emotionally expressive letters with one another from an early age, boys are typically encouraged to write for purely functional purposes like completing schoolwork or filling out paperwork. This is due to a dominant gender epistemology that frames emotionality and intellectuality as competing concepts, men think and women feel. As a result, male literacy is viewed as an, instrumentalist as an instrumentalist practice, a technology of the intellect rather than one of the heart, body, or spirit. Within this narrow framing, an engagement with emotions through writing is viewed as anti-intellectual and by extension, unmanly. Male resistance, male resistance to emotional work through literacy is further compounded by the undeniability of the practice. Male emotional engagement is often predicated on plausible deniability, where emotionally expressive practices are not aimed, named or analyzed in order to avoid emotional accountability. Men show affection and care to each other on the basketball court or the football field, but deny the emotional dimension of these practices under the guise of hypermasculine competitiveness. Men cry out of love and adoration for the male body of Jesus at church, but deny it happened once they leave the sanctuary. Men offer loving words and affection to their romantic partners in private, but deny them the same attention in public spaces. Unlike other forms of masculine emotional engagement that are private, perfunctory, or ephemeral, the practice of writing forces men to be undeniably present and reflective about their emotionality. That's why you send that text, you know what I mean? You be careful when you send that text, you can't delete it. As the male writer chooses certain words or articulates particular sentiments, he is forced to actively acknowledge that he has the capacity to feel an act itself that challenges the rules of patriarchal masculinity. After this process is ended, the writer leaves behind the written work itself, which stands as a relatively public and enduring record of his emotional work. He cannot pretend it didn't happen. For these reasons, the practice of doing emotional work through writing demands an ethic of risk and vulnerability that lingers behind the immediate moment of engagement. My notes of Leah began my journey to, of using literacy to do emotional work. For the first time, I could imagine writing as a space to negotiate unintended, unattended feelings of love, fear, joy, insecurity, longing, pain, and desire. My sixth grade class notes were eventually replaced by full-fledged letters to and from friends, family, comrades, and lovers. Through these letters, I was able to do emotional work that seemed otherwise undoable within the restrictive logic of black masculinity. I was able to reimagine literacy as a site of emotional inquiry, using the practice of writing to better understand, engage, confront, and more fully love myself and others. I'm going to stop there. The last piece, though, that is in there is the next piece of this is, is, is not saying, what up, kid? I know shit is rough doing your bid. When the cops came, you should have slid to my crib. Fuck it, black, no time for looking back is done. Plus, congratulations. I heard he looked like you. See, the Nas fellow got to know this. <laughs> so for me, this is important to me for a few reasons. One, this, this is sort of my attempt to, to make sense of this stuff through writing, through practicing writing. So I'm not learning from you, Black Man. Um, but also, it was a way for me to think about, to Joan's question, how we move this thing forward. I think it's through interventions, right? Where can we intervene in these conversations? I think one space is the work of literacy. Thinking about the work that we do early on, whether you're in first grade, you know, we encourage boys not to write poems sometimes, and girls to write poems, or uh, we tell boys not to read fiction. Even in our conscious community, we're reading the hard, real shit, and, you know, and, and, and not reading Tony Morrison. 
as if that has nothing to do with struggle, right? There are these ways in which literacy itself is a site of possibility for imagining and reimagining gender work and, and gender labor and gender epistemologies, et cetera. And so one of the questions I began to have is, what, where might there be spaces to be reflective about that gender work, that emotional work we do, right? How can hip-hop become a space for that, right? Oh, I can't see him coming down my eyes, so I gotta make the song cry, right? Using writing and literacy as a space for that to kind of outsource certain kinds of emotional labor, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes in problematic ways, right? Because you don't have to have that immediate engagement. Um, what are the ways that something like One Love, when Nas was writing, I remember I interviewed Nas maybe three or six months ago, and he said part of why he wrote the song was because he said the, the act of writing a letter itself showed that we must be friends when we write a letter. For men to write each other itself must be an act. Right? When I was pledging, you know, writing letters, you had to write letters, right? Writing letters to my big brothers, having sessions down at the house. Right? The whole point was the, act, the ultimate act of humility was writing a letter to another dude. So there's this way in which the practice of writing is not only gendered, but it's also a kind of emotional labor. And when you're in prison, you send that out, it's an emotional risk. If somebody don't write you back, why don't you let you write you? That becomes its own kind of thing. So for me, hip hop becomes a space of possibility for thinking about literacy. We're one more time with that problem. You know, I'm not going to read I don't, don't want to take up the time. But I, I, I started to reflect a little bit on my brother and, and my experience writing to him in prison. One of the things that I realized was after a while, he wasn't even expecting me to write back. He just needed to write to me. Because for him, that was his way of journaling his experience. But there's no gender, there's no space within our gender logic for men to have diaries. So in some ways, the prison letter wasn't even about. He said, "Why?" He said, "You don't even care." He said, "When he came home, he said, I don't even know if he was reading them. I just needed to say it, right?" So there's this way in which, again, we need to create space for men to articulate voice, men to, to articulate emotionality. And I think hip hop sometimes serves as a space for that. When you look at the tattoos we got on our body, it, it, there's a whole chapter on corporeality, corporeal literacy, this notion of how the body itself becomes another literacy site that is legible within the logic of masculinity, but might allow us to do some different kinds of work. Like, like I mean, Pac's body is a site of literacy. These brothers on the street corner, the same corner boys Mark was talking about, their bodies are covered. My body's covered with tattoos. And, and a lot of it was the emotional, I got my heart broken, got these. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, I got, I got a solid and Malcolm. And, and part of it was a, was a testimony to people who had, who had mattered to me in a certain kind of way, and I had no other language and space to articulate that. And so there's all these um, ways that I think we can reimagine literacy and the role that hip hop can play in that. And to reflect what the kind of work that's going on, but also to serve as a site of possibility for what could go on. I'm going to stop there. All right, all right. Um, <laughs> so you, you can, my boy in the back, you'll help me out. Um, this is just dope. I don't even know what to say. So I'm, I'm not going to say anything because I'm going to let my work just tell you guys how much I appreciate you. Um, so my. Uh, what I'm recently working on right now is this notion of game recognizing game, but we look, but we look at unfamiliar. And that is looking at some of the identities that I have in my life and how they function. And one of those salient, or two of those salient identities is being an openly black lesbian, and I'm a ball player. Check the stats. Um, and so, I have occupied very male spaces all of my life, right? Being a, a black lesbian and then also being um, being a ball player, I've been in hyper masculine spaces. And when you're talking about the quarter boys on the street, the quarter boys on the street raised me. I learned about femininity from men. I learned about how to treat women from men. And so, what does that mean for a black lesbian who identifies? with black masculinity, and how all the patriarchy and all the sexism that we see men portray, that is also passed down and there are influence, and that's how many black lesbians who identify and perform black masculinity, that's how we also engage with women. And linking that to what is happening in hip hop, and linking that to what is happening in the WNBA. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey through some dates. So this is the golden era of hip hop. Right? So you have, you know, we have Queen Latifah rapping, you got MC Light. But then there were some other people that we forget that I was in love with. Miss Melanie, right? Heather B. And they were aggressive. They weren't just like good MCs, they were aggressive. They were in your face, they were battle rappers. And they were that, even though we didn't know a thing about their sexuality, it was this maleness that they had, and I was intrigued by that. 
So then, as you take that, you go to 1996 to about 1997, moving into the early 2000s, we talk about how that's like the golden age of hip hop has ended. But I wanna argue that that is the golden age for black lesbians in hip hop. <laughs> because if you look at what's happening, right, this is people don't, this is 1996 and 1997, you get Missy, Heather B releasing the album, we got Brad releasing the album, we got Bahamadia, we got Foxy Brown, we got Queen Latifah, we even got this white girl. <laughs> we got Lady Rage. You have Little Kim, and then you have the one and only Lauren Hill. Right, so this is the score. So all my hip hop heads, oh, I was on Blood in the Reality. You won't bump in Blood in the Reality. You came with the Lauryn Hill when she did the score, right? But understand, this is a black lesbian's dream. Like, I'm, please, you got little Kim? Did I get my Lauryn Hill? Did I get my Brett? So all these identities and personalities and all these things I'm trying to cope with, 1996-97 is the year where this is, I would call, the golden age of black lesbians in hip-hop. And then 1996, we cannot forget, is the year of Set It Off. Right? This is all happening between 1996 and 1997. You see, we, we, we always get caught up in the hyper, the hypersexualization of women at this time, but not thinking about what is also happening with black lesbians at this time. And those lesbians who identify particularly with female masculinity. So I can be sitting there rocking to Lauryn Hill, and then Foxy Brown comes on and says, I got the. I'm in a good place. I'm in a truly good place at this moment. But also in 1996 is the first year of the WNBA. That is when they announced that they are going to say, we are, we are going to have our league. And their slogan is, we got next. Now what is happening in hip hop, trying to deny the voices of, of female MCs who are very masculine, the same thing is taking place in the WNBA. So what happens, you have these three individuals, Lisa Leslie, Rebecca Lobo, but Cheryl Swoops. Cheryl Swoops is supposed to be the poster child of the WNBA. Now side note, I am infatuated with Cheryl Swoops. For two reasons, she can play and she's pretty. And that is what the WNBA wanted to do. They wanted to downplay the lesbianism, players, and the fans. So they wanted to use Cheryl Swoops as the cornerstone of the WNBA. Because the one thing with this basketball can always not cross over because you got the pretty girl who can't play. And then you got the girl who identifies with black masculinity who can play, and they don't want to put that person as the poster child. So they need Cheryl Soups to be successful. So 1996, they introduce the WNBA, and the inaugural season is 1997. Now, all a while, while the WNBA is trying to deny what is happening, you got this beef going on between Queen Penn and Foxy Brown. And then Foxy Brown calls out Queen Latifah, and Queen Latifah's like, I'm not even in this. <laughs> and but it's what's interesting, and put a linchpin here, is that Queen Pin creates a song called Girlfriend. Now, also in the WNBA, you have Cynthia Cooper, MVP, back-to-back, -back, triple P, and it's getting a little momentum. But the WA, WNBA is not happy with what the league is becoming. And so the WNBA is starting to explore lesbianism. You ain't got to explore nothing. It's already there. But then in 1996, we get the first book really detailing black female masculinity. And even though it's written from a very white perspective, it is talking about how black masculinity, female masculinity, are the scraps and the rejections of real masculinity. And it's seen as an inferior product. So when you look at the success or the non-success of the WNBA, and you look at the success or the non-success of female rappers who identify with black masculinity, you will see this notion that they are an inferior product. But, <laughs> I'm not gonna act like I read Chicken Heads in 1999. I was a ball player. 
Okay, I graduated high school in 1997, uh, and I was a ball player. <laughs> I didn't go to college uh, to be an academic. I didn't go to college to read a book. I went to college to play basketball. Um, I did not actually physically go to the bookstore and get my books until I was in a master's program. So when I went to, when I graduated in 1997, I went to Old Dominion University. Old Dominion University had just lost a national championship to Tennessee the year before. So they were the number two school in the country. They made it known to all athletes that we were there to play basketball. You were not there to take a women's studies class. You were not there to take an African American, no, no biology. You were there to major in recreation and leisure. And that was my major. <laughs> then I left and I transferred to the University of Pittsburgh. That's around 2000. And I realized I'm probably not going to the WNBA. I can't even muscle nobody right now. And once you play UConn one time, you realize you're not going to the WNBA. <laughs> play UConn one time. You got practice round. You're not going to the WNBA. So once I played UConn, I kind of figured out, because I went to the Big East at that time, and I went to the University of Pittsburgh, I figured out I wasn't going to be going to play in the NBA. So I got my master's degree. I taught for two years. Um, so this is around 2003. And then I went into a PhD program. So around 2003, between 2003 and 2005, I started to actually read books. I figured I should put, pick some up since I'm not going to go to the WBA anymore. And this is where I pick up hip hop feminism. And I say that because I didn't take a women's studies, gender studies, African American class. I didn't know Bell Hooks, Audre Lorde, Barbara Smith. Those names were foreign to me. The first feminist I ever knew was Joan Morgan. And the notion of that was, so yeah, I want my brothers to fight sexism the same way that they're fighting racism, was a quote that stuck out to me because I was engaging in much patriarchy and sexism with my sisters trying to date each and everyone. <laughs> trying to holler at each and everyone. And in women's basketball, that's a very easy thing to do. <laughs> then we move and I get the next book. <laughs> and this is the quote that stuck out to me because I was struggling with this. So I, I'm, I'm getting my job more and I'm thinking like, how can I be a feminist? How can I be a hip hop feminist? How can I, how can I do you know, the, the sisters right? Then I get hit over the head with this. My affection for brown, for most deaf, miss fat booty frames one of the contradictions of thinking oneself a black man is feminist, black male feminist. For example, how does male feminism deal with the reality of heterosexual desires? And you see in red, I kind of flip it. How does feminism deal with black lesbian patriarchal desires? And that's truly what it was. Then Andrea Clay and Dr. E, right, put this thing in motion for me when she said, I used to be scared of it. <laughs> and she talks about these two binaries that black lesbians are confined to. That is the pimp and the nigga. And I was going in between both. Never trying to figure out what space I was going to occupy. So as I'm engaging in the new black men, as I'm engaging with hip hop feminism, as I'm engaging with trying to be an educator and a scholar and social justice and all these things, I'm not engaging with the patriarchy and the sexism that I am constantly engaging in in my day-to-day -day lives and trying to think back about how maleness and being and loving hip hop and loving basketball and being influenced by those hyper masculine spaces influence me as a black woman who loves women. Then in 2005, jumping back to the WNBA, Cheryl Swoops comes out and says she's a lesbian. <sighs> the WNBA is like, damn. Two things are happening to the WNBA. Either the players come out as a lesbian or they get pregnant. They can't win. And what's happening to me in my life is that that is my coach. 
That's my college coach, Coach Scott. I went every year, Nancy Lee Rick Klein, which is probably one of the best point guards ever to play college basketball, flew me down every summer to play with Cheryl Swoops. So when I saw this, I was like, and I'm calling everybody, Cheryl Swoops, we call Scott. <laughs> but the WNBA is in a panic zone. But what's happening in hip hop at this time as well? Well, then, also UConn. The WNBA is trying to compete with UConn, and UConn and Gino Armanier has a clean image. And they are winning, they are playing basketball. We can go down. 1999, 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, then 2005, 2009, 2014, 2015, national championships. They are drawing crowds larger than the WNBA. And sexuality is not on display because it's college basketball. He can curate how they are going to appear and look to the world, which is very different than the WNBA can do. So now the WNBA is trying to be UConn and get the popularity of UConn, because, but they can't. You can't control professional players the way you control college players. 2005, also, Ron is not here yet, you also get on the down low. So now you have America really thinking and engaging in this notion of whole homosexuality and what that means and it's a detriment to our community while the WNBA and hip hop is trying to push and push those barriers. Then you get that fool, R. Kelly, with his trapped in the closet foolishness that carries all these stereotypes and tropes of black males and sexuality and homosexuality within the black community. Then you get caution. Then you get caution, 2001, 2002, who goes on the radio, has a very flamboyant voice, he wants to be seen as the first gay rapper, it doesn't work. It backfires. And he had Kamora Lee and Russell Simmons co-signing it, it still backfired. There was no way they were going to let him in this space, even though he had bones. <laughs> now, at the same time, the WNBA is being pressured, pressured, because yes, they are tatted up, they are masculine, and they can play. So you have to deal with that. So you see, at the same time as the as the as hip hop is trying to wrestle with black female masculinity, so is the WBA, and they're drawing these comparisons right at the same time. But then 2013, you get Scholar Dick. And she is now going to be the poster child of the WBA. Why? Because she's pretty. And then, who comes along just like he came along with Foxy Brown? Jay-Z. Jay-Z wants to manage her, buys her Mercedes, pitches for her everywhere, she's throwing up the rock. And so now, hopefully, she will become the face of the WBA, and the WBA can move from that. And now she has hip-hop co-signing her. Skylar Diggins then becomes the poster child when Little Wayne comes out in a concert wearing her jersey. And that shapes everything. Every man is like, who is Skylar Diggins? Every female <laughs> is like, who is Skylar Diggins? <laughs> we are now getting WNBA season passes to see Skylar Diggins. But Brittany throws her off. Because the one thing that always happens, if this, whether it's hip hop or whether it is the WBA in sports, game recognized game. And so even though Skyler is the pretty girl, and even though she can shoot, the NBA had to and could not deny Brittany Griner. They had hushed and silenced everyone else for the last from 1996 on. But when she enters the league, they have to reckon with Brittany Grinder. She comes not only tatted up, she comes not only 6'8", but she also comes with girlfriends. And her girl got a girlfriend. And the thing about Brittany Grinder is there's a younger generation who is going to identify with her. And so you have the WNBA losing fan base, losing popularity, and many black lesbians and lesbians in general really upset with the climate 
because we are the fan base and you want to deny us. It wasn't until 2014 that the WNBA even embraced like having anything to do with LGBTQ issues. And so Brittany Griner is undeniable. She not only is openly queer, she then dates one of the most, another player in the WNBA. They get married and then they appear on Who Wore the Dress, the wedding show. And so now you can market her in so many ways. And now Brittany Griner becomes a new face of the WNBA, of female masculinity, black female masculinity, and basketball. At the same time, I want to focus on Young M.A. out of Brooklyn, right? And you have to reckon with her because, again, she got bars. And now she is somebody who is changing the face of hip-hop. She is tatted up. And going back to Queen Pen, as you to put a pin in that, her newest single, Girlfriend. Talking about her girlfriend. And so the work that I want to do around this is really talk about that timeline, but then also what does it mean to have these two positionalities, these two identities working at the same time, where black females, black females who identify with female masculinity and how we have fallen into the tropes of patriarchy, how we have fallen into the tropes of not being able to express ourselves around women, how we have fallen into the nigga play a role. And you see it when you go to the clubs, you see it when you're out there. And then there's another part of that, is that Brittany Griner and, and Young M.M., and M.A., why are they successful? So we also have to question that because they fall into that play a bigger role. And so when you perpetuate stereotypes and patriarchy as black women, female, masculinity, you also get a pass. You don't have the homophobia. You don't get the slurs because, yeah, I'm objectifying another woman just like that man is. And how these things are passed on regardless of your body part. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm going to actually throw to the audience fairly quickly, but I want to just do one more round of questions. Um, you know, I, one of the things that used to be really funny from Mark and I when we were out on the road lecturing is that we had uh, invariably in some audience usually um, in the middle of the country, <laughs> in a relatively small town, would question our legitimacy to talk about hip hop because we were intellectuals or scholars. And I used to be like, I grew up in the South Bronx in the 1970s. I'm not even really sure why I should have a discussion about my <laughs> legitimacy. <laughs> I'm not even sure. A, you weren't born yet. B, you're from here. So I like this is no conversation. <laughs> but I think what has been really interesting to me when I think about that time period is my claim to why I felt I could claim hip hop to do a particular kind of work came partially from just sheer geography, from being um, Caribbean American, being Jamaican specifically, growing up in the South Bronx in the 70s at a particular time, and my age. But people have always asked why, you know, why hip hop feminism? Those things are not supposed to get to come go together. What was it about hip hop that allowed me to think that I could even explore what a functional feminism would look like for a hip hop generation? And you know, obviously I had a lot of reasons about for that, so I wrote a book about it. But I am interested because all of us on this panel could be positioned as outsiders of what people think is true hip hop culture. And I want to know for each of you if you could tell us what was it about hip hop that made you stake your intellectual claim there and write yourself into the narrative, even as people that um, people would try to dismiss as outside of culture? <laughs> I said that was funny. I like you did that. Um, what was it about hip hop? Um, I kind of felt like you. I mean, I grew up in Philly, you know, North Philly, so I didn't have the the organic, like, you know, hip hop grew up around, around me. Argument that people from the Bronx never let you forget. <laughs> but but I, mean, I was surrounded by hip hop. I grew up, uh, you know, we my parents didn't really buy a lot of records. We we had, we had eight tracks and records, and, and the only thing I remember seeing was Steve well, Steve Wonder and Sugar Hill Gang. And it was I don't even know why my parents had them. 
But that's what they had, and so for me, hip hop was as much a part of my early memory as anything else. Um, hip hop was how I made, and I talked about this in my first book, Be Be Sure I Was a Passion. Like hip hop was a big part of sort of how I came to understand myself growing up in North Philly, but being put on a school bus to go to the Northeast, working class white neighborhood. Um, in a lot of ways, although I grew up in the hood of hoods in Philly, I, I spent a lot of time, so like now I was talking about, in, 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 my, in my room writing, you know, looking out of the project window, looking out to see what was going on. And hip hop became my other way to understand the world. Hip hop became my other avenue of um, Hip hop just became my thing, you know. So when I heard KRS, when I heard Kane, when I was listening to all of that stuff, it, it, it helped me understand myself. When I was listening to the, the battles over the bridge, you know what I mean? For me, I didn't even, I had been there. I wouldn't go to Queens Bridge for 20 more years. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be to Queens Old Bronx, but understanding battles over territory and space and what it meant to claim your hood mattered to me because I was trying to find a hood to claim. So for me, hip hop was very much at the center of, of who I was and what I was. And when I got to school as a, as a graduate student and as a high school student and as a teacher, I taught high school, I was a high school Spanish teacher for a while. Um, one of the, the things I saw was the gap between who, my, who, who school saw my students as and who these students were when I saw them on the street corner, the same kids that were struggling readers were writing rhymes at home, the same kids that were considered behavior problems and at-risk youth in school were doing all kinds of interesting work on the ground. And so for me, hip-hop became a way of closing the gap between who they were and who school thought they could be. And, and it became my way of closing the gap as an educator of how of reaching them. It became my way of reaching them. And so for me, uh, no matter how much people say, well, you get, because now they say I'm too old, that's the, the, the issue. Now, I taught a Jay-Z Nas class this semester at Morehouse. And I'm talking about the Tupac battle, and they like, we weren't born. My first year weren't born when Tupac and Big were battling. You know what I mean? Pac died September 96. You know what I mean? It'll be, that'll be 19 years ago in the fall. So if you were a college freshman, you weren't even born when that battle happened. Meanwhile, I was in my dorm room crying. You know? So I find that it's more, it's more age now. And, but I use that to leverage. Like, oh, y'all, y'all weren't even there. I knew it. And then you started being like your grandparents and shit. You know what I mean? Like, I, was, I was there when Pac died. Right, exactly. Um, I guess I'll, I'll for me, um, I see it as an organic experience, even though I didn't grow up in the Bronx, I grew up in upstate New York. Um, but my I, I am the baby of my family. My brother is 15 years older than me, my sister is 10. Uh, my parents were dumb. Like I was truly a mistake. Um, they remind me of that all the time. So when hip hop emerged, my, my older brother was on it. He got everything. He bought he bought into I mean, and he was a chunky dude, so like he was the fat boys, like he wanted to be part of the fat boys. And so I just remember, and then my, my father truly thought he was James Brown. <laughs> and when I say he thought he was James Brown, I mean the clothes, the hair, the high heel shoes. Um the, you know, he was he was serious about that. Kate, you know, he, my mother was like, you're not doing the cake. Um, so, like, when they were beefing, my father would play, it's a man's world. So you would walk in the house like, oh, you just knew what was, like, James Brown was the mold for everything that happened in my house. So when my father heard all this music that my brother was coming in, and they were sampling James Brown, my father and my brother would have serious arguments. And I was just privy to sit around and listen to it. And I absolutely loved it and adored it. And I loved the conversation that they would have. And then my brother would bring in everybody. And I would steal his tapes and he would steal them back. And you know, my mother would say, you know, she's too young to listen to that. And I would be like, nah, she good. <laughs> and so, you know, growing up with these two big males in my house were, were, were critical to how I identified and how I understood hip hop. And having them battle and go back and forth and argue was just unbelievable space for me. Then when I became an educator, similar to you, I knew the power of it. I knew the power of it in my own hood. You know, when I think about Nas, Nas explained the world to us. You know, it was our pathway to understand what was going on. And so when I became a teacher, I knew I had to bring it in. I didn't know how, but I knew it was an important part. And so I just see it so organic because it was such a part of my early growing up and my early experiences with my brother, my mother, my brother and my father. And then as an educator, um, no matter where I taught in Pittsburgh, I taught in Miami, and I taught in Atlanta. And no matter where I was, you know, you had your local hip hop 
and then you had your, your that emotion and, and raw imagination where hip hop took these kids someplace. And I knew that I could always draw on it. And so, you know, I, I kind of split my work between all my positionalities. You know, I do work in, in, in queer studies, I do work with queer teachers and queer youth because I'm queer. I do work with urban kids because I'm urban. I do work with uh, you know hip hop and hip hop education because I'm a teacher and I love hip hop. So I'm like, when people come at me, I'm just like, I'm researching myself. I'm finding out about myself. I'm finding out about people who look like me and that's what my research is about. And I think for people of color um, who are researchers, we are always trying to figure out something about us. That, that, that's the part of research. And then when you get paid for it, it's like, what's up? <laughs> so the first time I ever saw an African Ben Bada, who was walking through my neighborhood in the Bronx, who were up in the Thoughts and Castle Projects, um, literally just across the river from, from Bronx River. Um, one of the people in my neighborhood was a cat by the name of Ike C who was brought into the Zulu Nation somewhere around 1979, 1980. I knew Ike because we played Sandlot baseball. Um, but my mama was not trying to have me in the street. So hip hop was something that was happening out there. And, and like now, I'm sitting in the project window, <laughs> <laughs> listening to the stuff that's going down, plugged into the park, you know, down the block. That said, and, and I said a little bit about this earlier, the thing for me about hip hop, when I first heard it in the Bronx in the mid-1970s, it, it wasn't about lyrical content. It, it was the sound of it that changed the landscape. When cats were walking around New York City in boom boxes and folks were scattering, they didn't hear anything about the lyrics. They just heard that boom back. And so for me, the earliest moments of it mattering to me was being introduced to breakbeats. In the summer of 1978, first time I heard Erwin Kelly and live dance and drums beat, First time I heard T Connections Groove to Get Down, I asked my parents for a boombox for my birthday that year so that I could start making pause button tapes. I know a whole bunch of y'all don't know nothing about, about pause button tapes. Because your mama wasn't buying you a mixer. And she wasn't buying you two turntables that were better than the turntable that they had. And you weren't messing with her turntable. Don't break my needle. And y'all don't know nothing about that, right? Because y'all ain't got record players. You ain't breaking my needle, right? So she got me a little cheap stereo and got me a little boom box, and I would find those breaks, and I would do my own loops with the little pause button tapes, and you could hear the click of the pause button. <laughs> and that was not only my introduction to hip hop, that was my introduction to an archivist's life. Because then I went through my daddy's record, collection, and I found that single of Funky Drummer, and then I went to the store and bought that Paul Winley Super Disco Breaks that all had all the breaks, Captain Sky and Super Spur, all of that, the meters, all of that, and it's like, for me, it was just the sound of that. The fact that 12 years later, when I decided to become a New York City school teacher, and I'm doing my little exam, right? And that's back in the day where you could teach in New York City with, you know, just a degree because they needed teachers. And they wanted you to extrapolate on something, right? Some text, Shakespeare, some, some shit like that. <laughs> I wrote on Harris once entertaining. And, and I still got through. The first time I realized I was going to teach popular culture was as a high school teacher in Walton High School up in the Bronx. <laughs> And New, York, New Jack City had just been released, right? You know that soundtrack, but I want to set you up and all that. And, and, and they're like riots in a couple of what they call riots, right? We just know them as like club fights at a couple of theaters in New York City after screenings in New Jack City. And I went into the class the next day, we had a conversation about why the media depicted young black folks that way in relationship to a couple of fights that broke out. Right. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm doing for the rest of my life. Right. And I would have never imagined that in 1978, right? Nor would I have imagined in 1978, right, sitting in a classroom like Duke University, right, that's what I, I, I couldn't go to Duke. 
Now, I wasn't that kind of dude, right? I could not go to Duke, let alone be a professor at Duke. But sitting in a classroom 20 years after that, in a Duke University classroom, co-teaching the class on hip hop with a Grammy Award winning producer, right? Or sitting up in Harvard, like my sisters Regina and Bettina and my man Deshaun are gonna do in the fall at the Hip Hop Archive at Harvard University, a Hip Hop Archive at Harvard University, a Hip Hop Archive at Cornell, a former Hip Hop Archive and Museum at Stanford, what? Right. We never imagined any of this, right? And that's just the intellectual component. We ain't talking about what the money is going like. The fact that we all have created careers on some level in which we eat off. The idea that hip hop has been something that has been valuable and viable to our lives since 1973. Right? And so, you know, when I'm playing with them little pause button tapes, right? and you know, you know, me and Joe's joke here is like, you know, though we ain't never done anything romantic because we were besties, but you know, we are like the brown sugar store. That, that's us. <laughs> Sanan, what's his name? Right? That, that's us. Right, that, that's the brown sugar story. Right, the first time I read Joe, her ice cream review in the Village Voice 1990, I'm walking down the block, open up the Village Voice, this is when the joint was free. And Nelson George was in those papers, and Harry Allen was in those papers, and Greg Tate was in those papers, and Lisa Jones was in, Stanley Crouch was in those papers, played Bill Benjamin, I mean, they just go on and on with the genius, the Lonnie Davis, the now Dr. Lonnie Davis, all these folks right in the middle of this shit was free. Right? I'm walking through John Walker, talking to John Walker, and I'm reading this Ice Cube review, and I'm like, oh, damn, this, this, I'm doing this shit. really interesting is that we none of us came up at a time where you could conceivably go to college and think you were going to have a career in hip hop. Like that didn't happen. There was no hip hop scholarship. There was no hip hop journalism. Um, a, a cohort of myself and, and maybe six other people at the time really created that as a genre. There was no Brian, Kevin Powell, Danielle Smith, Karen Mayo, Dream Hampton. We were the only people doing what we were doing in terms of like Sheila Lester out on the West Coast, it was a very small number of us. Um, and so what hip hop has always been to me, a place of impossibility, where people tell you you can't, and you go, but I want it, and I'm gonna do it anyway. So um, I wanna say that, but I think even on a more personal level, my education has always been in very culturally schizophrenic places. So I was that ABC student. You know, I was that person that got put in academically gifted classes, and then they put you in an environment where you are like, not only just one of the very few black people, but you're like, in class-wise, you're one of the very few working class people there. And I was first generation immigrant. Um, the thing that kept me grounded in all those spaces is that hip hop had to come with me. Because I was being taught a narrative that success meant assimilating out, of everything that I knew, everything that made me me, and that if the, no matter what, if I could bump every B in my camp in my dorm room at Wesleyan, I was good, you know what I mean? I was good. And as culturally the rest of the world wanted what I already had laid claim and access to, it was a really wonderful time and a really um, beautiful place to be. But I also want to bring up that the real, there was a real imperative to do this work because it was something that Ariel talked about yesterday. Journalists were going to do this work. When I started, none of them looked like me. There were white boys from Yale, there were white boys from Harvard, they didn't know nothing about my hood, and the writing wasn't good. You know, and so I had no interest in being a music journalist. Like, I didn't even really read music journalism. I didn't know, I mean, I know you love Tatum, and I love him too, but they didn't grow with music journalism, and I was like, I don't know what a thrashing boom box, or like, what is that? Do people read reviews and that's how you buy it? Like, nobody does that. But when I figured out that I could write about hip hop and it would give me a space in a national newspaper to write about culture, 
to write about black people, to write about black women and gender issues, to write about gender relationships, and I could all do that under the guise of writing about like Sean Puffy Combs? Why not? You know? Why not? So I think that hip hop is the way that many of us were able to kind of sneak in what was important to us through the back door. No one really knew that we were doing it until it was way too late to stop it. <laughs> What's up, Riley? Hey, I am so glad to be with you. <laughs> it has been a day, <laughs> but it is worth it to be here, and I just wish that I had had more opportunity to learn from everyone who's given talks before and to have been um, witness to this panel. Um, so interestingly, I decided to think about time. So ooh, there it is. Here's some enactment of um, some antagonizing time. Um, and the full title uh, is Restivity on the Temporality of Hip Hop Masculinities. Let me also say I'm so um, humbled and grateful for the introduction. I want to especially thank um, Trevor Lindsay and Tay Glover and OSU and the other organizers of the Hip Hop Literacy Conference. Um, so I don't think the clicker is working. So if I can just, if I just do a signal like that, would you move to the next slide? Would that work? Uh, not yet. Well, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> can we go back to the first slide? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm gonna just get started. All right. So about a year ago, um, my book nobody's supposed to know. Black sexuality in the download. Um, came out, and um, in it, I was interested in thinking about the emergence and circulation of the concept of the download, a uh, term that typically refers to black and white men and women, don't identify as gay, sexual, or queer, in news and popular culture. And I argue that download narratives are simply one of many that link blackness with duplicity. And as I noted in the book, the coupling of black and queer is not new, so I felt like I was already in a conversation um, with black feminists and black queer studies, um, which attended to the distinct and yet co constitutive productions of blackness and queerness. So the devil's emergence in the early 21st century reflects an articulation and a propagation of a two-part formula of blackness as pathology. So on one hand, you've got blackness as figured as somehow too homophobic, right, for, to allow black people to construct proper sexual identifications, and then on the other hand, blackness is also characterized as so lascivious as to be unable to constrain any imaginable sexual proclivity. The conceptualization of blackness and the download conceal what I argue is ultimately at stake in these representations, that is, in casting the download as a whole problem, it presents as a solution something roughly analogous to, well, black people should just come out. Um, and that, I think, masks a more insidious issue which is a way these narratives call for greater surveillance, increased transparency, and more acute forms of regulation. So as it relates to perceptions of hip hop, one might say that hip hop has a bad rep and a bad rap, but which I mean that commentary about mainstream hip hop, which is only a tiny fraction of the form that hip hop takes, has social problems like misogyny, transmisogyny, homophobia as uniquely hip hop's province, or if not its sole province, then one of its most acute manifestations. So we know there are numerous examples of folks performing different models, um, and you know uh, we can look at the kind of people who intersect with the mainstream, like Sid the Kid or Lil B or Taylor Banks, Nicki um, Minaj. Right? There's a ton of work that's happening around people who are intersecting with the mainstream. Um, but we can also think about the works of figures like Big Frida or Black Cracker or uh, Leaf Le Le Left quite mean how to pronounce that uh, artist name. And other queer and gender non-conforming people who are performing today in what is sometimes referred to as the indie scene home lot or sissy downs. And there we confront what these particular critiques of hip hop also are, and by virtue of necessity, attempts to constrain hip hop's multiplicities. So in 2012, um, Scott Colson Bryant and I co-organized a one-day symposium on the queerness of hip hop, hip hop queerness, and in accompanying special issue in Palimpsest, um, a number of scholars in the room are represented in that um, special issue, and I 
they speak to um, the questions of this panel and to others, and I, I hope if you haven't seen it, you'll take a look. Um, but tucked away, I wrote this piece on Jocelyn Hernandez of Love and Hip Hop Atlanta fame. And um, I was curious about the frequency with which news outlets, bloggers, gossip columnists insinuated that she was trans. And I wanted to mark that as a form of masculinity studies. Um, or at least a kind of gender studies that has us really critically examine how masculinity looks, feels, and operates. So the degree to which transness gets attached to or becomes attached to other non-trans bodies, right, or particularly non-trans feminine bodies in hip hop, uh, something that you can also see in um, figures like Sierra, Beyonce's entourage, um, um, et cetera, right? Like those might be other generative sites to think about where we can locate masculinity and masculinity studies and hip hop masculinity. So in the article on Jocelyn, however, I posited that um, a, an argument about the problems of the visual in terms of how gender is determined in the case of black people. Or put differently, I wanted to think with Spillers on the notion of ungendered blackness, which he describes as the kind of outcome of a new world order forged by the theft of body and the theft of planet. And I wanted to situate that alongside Brown and Hartman, and I'm not saying he Hartman, when they point to differential gendering and how those theories can come alive in the realms of hip hop. So given that hip hop is a constantly proliferating form, I want to suggest that perhaps there are as many genres of gender as there are forms or modalities for hip hop's expressivity. So as I've been working on a new project, I realized that, um, at least for me right now, there are two major questions that are animating my thinking. One, I'm interested in the ways technology and mass mediation amplify particular conditions of blackness, anti-blackness, and circulation. Um, so in the book, I use the concept of the glass closet as one way of thinking about the amplification of, of kind of logics of capture. But in the new work, which I hope to share just a piece of this with you today, um, and actually it's, it's embedded in the, in the article from Palimpsest, but I want to give you a longer, slightly longer piece. I want to think a little bit about mid 20th century stories of gender revelation um, and what they help us to imagine or think differently about the ways that race and gender are seen to be things that are visually determined. Um, and that those kinds of visual determinations take place on the narrow grounds, or what I would say are narrow, constraining grounds, of authenticity versus artifice. Right? So, now the second thing um, that I'm really interested in, and this is what really leads me to this archive that I'm going to make an argument for as a hip hop archive. Um, but I'm, I'm profoundly curious about, the what, about what we can glean from narratives that might serve as strategies for living um, and index the, the degree to which blackness can remain a space of fugitive possibility. Right? So even as I'm focusing on a narrative from the early mid-1950s, um, let me suggest a few ways to hear this figure for hip-hop and masculinity studies and hip-hop masculinity studies. So the first one is that if we think again, if we, if we think about the twin constrained logics of artifice and authenticity, which are concepts that also index the way identity is sutured to the visual, play themselves out across bodies and the multiple forms that hip hop manifests. So we can think about soundscapes, print, other kinds of modalities. Right? The second argument for how we can hear this figure, if we think about how hip hop messes with time, right? as in the way a sample presses or folds old into new time, or the way the skipping of a beat indexes the presence of an absence of a particular demarcation of time, which is to say that sonically, hip hop has always found a way to incorporate its usable past, or put differently, hip hop inform, hip hop performs a kind of sonic sociogenesis in an ongoing process of becoming. And then the third way to hear this figure, so if a political project for hip-hop and hip-hop masculinity could be framed as matters of maneuverability, right? Maybe you can also think about what maneuverability, how that articulates with Moten's work on fugitivity or even just thinking about the reading, right? 
um, then what like what might a figure like McCarris Grant bear? Then then the figure McCarris Grant bears a great deal on how we might imagine masculinities for our hip hop futures. So the folding of time. Thank you. Okay, so on July 29, 1954, tucked away at the bottom of a page in the National News section, Jet published a paragraph length article with the headline, Mississippi Woman Poses as a Man for Eight Years. Quote, when Coast Kids through Mississippi, police arrested Husky James and Harris for driving a car with improper lights. Husky. They made an astonishing discovery. Jaden and Harris was really 30 year old Emily Grant, a 175 pound woman who had been posing as a man for eight years doing heavy duty mail work as a garage mechanic. Uh, one quotation from McCarris Grant I posed as a man in my own money. Jet's inclusion of McCarris Grant's presumably better compensated heavy duty mail work re inscribed popularly circulating ideas about passing as a practice in which individuals assume privilege through cross racial or cross gender performance. <coughs> usually in order to attain greater life chances, such as financial security, increased mobility. But in framing McCarris Grant's narrative through the logic of passing, the article reproduces common sense notions of gender authenticity, while simultaneously framing the figure's gender crossing as motivated by personal gain. So even in its brevity, the language of the article manages to enact what Jack Halberstam describes as the three recurring motivations present in representations of trans life produced by and for non-trans people. Stabilization, rationalization, trivialization. These are all containing strategies to minimize public anxiety over the instabilities of trans people and folks. In November of the same year, Ebony prints a five-page feature replete with images of McCarris Grant under the headline, The Woman Who Lived as a Man for 15 Years. So like the coverage in Jet, the article begins with an explanation of the scene of McCarris Grant's capture. Quote, into the small bare office of the mayor of Cuscoso, Mississippi, a policeman walked with a husky prisoner. Reflecting the perspective of the mayor, who was also Cuscoso's city court judge, Ebony described Mayor T.B. Rome's reaction upon hearing the encounter between McCarris Grant and the police officer during what began as a pullover for a traffic violation. As Ebony reported, quote, the policeman told Mayor T.B. Rome when I tried to search him, he protested and told me, take it easy on the woman. Within the confines of the mayor's office, which also served as the courtroom, Rome reported to Ebony that he told, quote, Andy Lee, if you want to prove to me you're a woman, you can do it, but you don't have to unless you want to, end quote. McCarris Grant, in response, went into a closet and emerged having discarded shirt, pants, male underwear. So in an editorial flourish, the article concluded the opening vignette with the description of the moment of sentencing. Quote, one of the strangest courtroom scenes in American legal history was quickly culminated when Mayor Rome hurriedly fined the defendant $100 or 30 days in jail. The word of the sensational unmasking of Jim McHarris quickly got around Kosciuszko and jarred the quiet small town. Quote. So with dramatic flair, Ebony staged what Eric Stanley described as the domain of gender as one of the most volatile points of contact between state violence and a body. McCarris Grant's contact with the state, at least in terms of the article, is initiated by an instance of driving while black. At the open, and as the opening scene, So here's how here's how I'll move it along. Let's go to the next. On the right hand, I'll just talk through the slides themselves. So on the top right is Andy, is McCarris Grant at prison camp, right? So McCarris Grant goes to prison. Um, these are these central these images here, um, the one at the bottom, the one uh, in prayer, are images of uh, McCarris Grant in community. Next slide. This is the second page feature, right? Which is an actual visual doubling of what the opening scene's about, right? This moment of capture, this moment of undress. So part of what I'm interested in, in thinking about here is to say that um, there's a there's a kind of 
um, that the media coverage of McHarris Grant is serving a dual function with the with the law, with the state, right? Um, next slide. And these are two other accompanying images, which this is what I wanted to pull and think about. Um, Ebony writes about McHarris Grant as still rested. Now, rested means two things. It means, on one hand, it means to be restless, right? To constantly move. On the other hand, it means to be obstinately still. In both situations, it means to resist control. And I'm thinking about that as a site for thinking about both a project of hip hop, both a project of about giving about kind of freedom for gender multiplicity, gender expressivity. And then for me, I think the Karis Grant becomes then both a four person and a person from the future that can help us to think masculinities differently. So that was what I was getting to. <laughs> okay, um, I'm just gonna ask someone to keep who is keeping track of time to help me with the Q&A so I know exactly how many we can take, but at this point we'd love to open up for Questions? Yes? Hi, thank you all again for coming. I have a question about um, practical steps in, um, for children as we're helping young black males and females in thinking about um, masculinity and gender differently. And I'll give you an example of um, there's a white activist who was asked, How did he become so conscious so early? And his parents made a, a conscious effort to put him in a black daycare where he had um, black people over him, right? So he grew up in a space knowing that there's black people can be in authority and it was, it was, it was a normalized for him, right? So I'm thinking about, I know at least Dr. Love and, um, and um, Dr. Neal have kids, but I'm wondering what maybe you use or what would you suggest to either parents or teachers as they think about moving beyond these boundaries um, particularly for black men. I think Mark actually said something that's really important. Um, I, I was one of those young boys who kept a diary. Uh, in fact, I still have many of them. Um, how do we create spaces, particularly for young black boys, young brown boys, that encourages introspection and, and interiority? Um, I think too often, and this is not just something that's the reality of black boys, um, we often define ourselves based on what's presented to us in the world that we're supposed to aspire to. Um, we don't create enough spaces for folks to think inside about who they are and who they want to be. And literacy programs would be one way to do that. Um, actually sitting with young black children as they consume popular culture. And, and so that part and parcel of that experience is actually to talk with them about what they are seeing on screen, right? Allowing them to tell you what they see and, and allowing them a space to think that they can express what they're feeling about what they're consuming and then finding ways to gently nudge them to think about those things in different ways. You know, the problem with popular culture is not just what's the content of it and what's produced, but we don't create rich networks and spaces to allow us to think seriously about it, what it is. You know, too often we're reading through very bad Facebook think pieces. <laughs> you know, it's not about people actually doing the work of being closely engaged with what they're consuming. Uh, and young folks are, are ready for that. I mean, they really want to talk to us about the stuff that they're watching on TV, the stuff that they're reading, the movies that they're going to see. And I think for young boys to create a space where they're consuming stuff and actually giving them an outlet, why don't you write a couple of paragraphs? about what you just saw, or this particular, why does this rap song move you the way that you do? Why don't you write a couple of paragraphs? In fact, let's build a blog post for you, blog spot for you. So not only can you write about this, you know that it has a public space, right, where it can affirm your own ideas and you may be able to cultivate other folks to do work for your own self. Yes. Um, I have a question about the whole Baptist dynamic? I know like my friends use it and I use it and we think of it as being well grounded in the other sense, but I know like in media representations it's like, oh she has the looks and she's you know able to play guys and have a different conversation. And then the man that I'm here with right now, 
he doesn't like the term at all. He's like, why don't you call yourself like a respectful woman, whatever, whatever. But me and my friends, we did, yeah, I'm a bad bitch, this is what I can tell. So how do you guys feel about that multiple angle of people around that? You, I'm sorry, you said bad bitch? Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to be clear. All right. Anybody? That's what I can put it. That's a John question. <laughs> um, you know, I, I when I when I first started doing this work, part of the tension that I ran up against people is that like their major problem with hip hop and fighting misogyny was like, why do they have to call us bitches and hoes? And I would be like, okay, well he didn't say bitch or hoe, but he's talking about kicking a chick down the stairs while she's pregnant. That's fairly misogynist. So for me, this has never been about policing of language. And I do believe in the time-honored tradition of black folk to take language, invert it, turn it on its head, um, give power to a term, um, and be able to operate from that space. So if the space, to me, we have to allow room for what we have always done and not necessarily try to think in these binary ways where if you're calling yourself, because someone can still call you queen and be sexist as hell. <laughs> Actually, more often than not. <laughs> so I think we have to move past these sort of binary ways and limited ways that we think about language and understand what is the power in there for. You know, if you're a bad bitchness that doesn't, it is limiting in your humanity, right? If a bad bitch means that you've only interpolated that to be like a strong black woman who then is not vulnerable in certain ways, who doesn't want support in certain kind of ways, where, who is not saying she is sick or hurting or lonely, then your bad bitchness is a problem. But I think that you are capable of policing your own bad bitchness in a way that works for you, and I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Like, there are other battles that I want to fight in hip hop that are really deeper than language. They're more about structures. Any other questions? I'm sorry, was there a question? Oh. Is it not yet? Oh, okay. <laughs> I think you were chewing or something. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say something to your question really quickly. Uh, something that I read probably once a year is Audrey Lord's uh, Man Child. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I have to constantly read that. Uh, probably twice a year, it's getting to that point now. Um, but she talks a lot about raising the son as a lesbian and, and destroying him to make him new. So I, I, would, I would just suggest that. That's what I read before I had my son, and I, I try and go back to the reality. Um, I just speak from the perspective of being a parent of raising a son as a feminist woman. I'm now having a teenager who has a feminist. Um, he calls himself feminist conscious. He, you know, doesn't exactly call himself a feminist, but he's very aware of being raised by a feminist mother. Um, I feel like I had to do a lot of policing very early on um, to protect my child from people who wanted to um, form his gender identity for him and police his masculinity in certain ways. So, you know, and I am Jamaican, so that there's a particular kind of masculinity that swings through that. So, like, I would cuss people out for telling, you know, my son is two, don't tell him not to cry. He's supposed to cry, he's two. He's not a man, you know what I mean? Like, you're a man, no he's not, he's two. So, but that, that kind of virulent sort of, don't come in, my, my son plays with dolls, it's particularly fine that he plays with dolls. He doesn't like dolls anymore at 16, but I let him make the decision about, like, when he wanted to stop that. Um, because what I realized is that I did stop him from painting his room pink, but I didn't all pink, but you know, red. I was like, we'll find a way to put pink in there a little creative, because I just knew that he would spend too much time trying to defend that decision. Um, but you know, what I realized in his doll play and watching that, it was never about him just playing with dolls. It was like, he liked having male friends. And I was a person who chose a male best friend at three. So I could recognize what that was about. And the girls liked to be there because they liked to play out these different gender things with their dolls. They wanted, they like had different ways of conceiving family with their dolls. So it was really a, a combination of very strong and vigilant 
policing of my, my family and friends and their own kind of sexism, but also allowing my son's gender identity to unfold in front of me in ways that taught me and that weren't judgmental. And, you know, I would argue that one of the biggest divides in hip hop now, and one that we probably don't talk about enough, is the parenting. Uh, Joan has a son, I have two daughters, Mark has a daughter, um, Bettina has a daughter and a son, uh, and you just think by what they're hearing on the radio. I, I think it's so much more complex than that. The, the biggest challenge for me is actually trying to explain to the 16 or 12 year old why I love it in the first place. I, you know what, because I, I keep wondering to myself, down the road when folks look at what this is, what was it about this that attracted it to you, right? And, and I need to have an answer for that, right? You know, my answer at the moment is just to put it on Pete Rock and see how smooth and reminisce over you, and, 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 and that does the labor that I need to do. <laughs> But, but I think that's real, um, and particularly for our kids now who don't, who are not tethered to hip hop in that way, yeah. right? Rap music is a genre of music, right? It's, it's not a worldview. It's not a culture that orders our experiences the way that it did, you know, for not for two generations. And I, and I think when we're more honest about why we love it, it forces us to be reflective about the practices themselves and how they might also complicate our notions of masculinity. You know, like. Part of why we, I love hip hop was because it gave me excuse to hang with my homies. The same reason I play ball, I play ball too. You know, part of the reason I love this is that's you can you can hang with your homies. You can give dude a hug. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, there was opportunity for that. Like yes, sir. Like, maybe, like you play with dogs. We all play with dogs. We just love action figures. <laughs> it's the same piece of plastic or the same factory. It's just, you know, neither of them had genitalia. You know what I mean? But, just, you know, but, but we but we but we we. we in a way that doesn't allow us to have to be accountable for that stuff. So I was thinking, what would it mean for us to think about all of us as playing with dogs? What would it mean for all of us to think about hip hop practices as homosocial and sometimes homeboy erotic? What would it mean for us to think about all this stuff through new eyes? I mean, to me, that that's the interesting thing about what y'all are saying. Oh my gosh. Four dudes in a Toyota Corolla. Right. <laughs> right. With a tribe called Quest, and everybody's sitting there. Yes. Like, oh, yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's what we did, right? Yes. Uh, Dr. Neal, you mentioned earlier, uh, you know, it, you find it easy in these spaces to kind of talk about, you know, male feminist, feminism and, and, and approach, but the difficult situations are in a barbershop. So me and my beautiful fiance we have had this discussion uh, about, you know, locker room talk and what kind of happens in the locker room. And she always challenged me on it, like, are you saying this in the locker room? And so, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm interested in how you all sort of deal with this locker room talk uh, and, and kind of, you know, how, how do you kind of handle that situation when you're in, that, in a barbershop or in a locker room or, you know, you, 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 do you kind of let it happen when, when, it, when there's an opportunity or do you sort of create opportunities to, to bring it up? I, I think, and I hate this term, but I, I think you have to be real and jump in here when you, when you must work. You have to be real and authentic about who you are in these places. Um, if I'm in the barbershop, and I can remember this like it was yesterday, because I was there with one of my colleagues, Maurice Wallace, um, and the King issue with Serena had come up. And we're all sitting there in the barbershop passing that King issue around. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I. I yeah, I might be a, a black male feminist, but this is like Serena in King Magazine, right? If I'm honest and real about who I am, I'm looking at her, right? <laughs> Period, right? And, and I think that kind of stuff is important because when the conversation has to slip, has to change, and we're dealing with the same sex proposition in North Carolina, and I'm back in the barbershop, right? And dudes are like, you know, I ain't working for that gay shit, right? And, 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 I'm in a barber shop. It's Tuesday. Folks are voting, and, and I can have the conversation with them. Well, you know, it's not just about same-sex relations. It's about non-married domestic partnerships. So that if you're in a relationship with this woman that you've been living with for three years and eating her food and and living off of her paying her rent, and you're hoping to get on her health care insurance, 
This law is going to keep you from being able to do that, for real. <laughs> and, and, they, and they're making it seem like it's about domestic partners, same-sex domestic partnership, so you won't actually figure that out. Oh, damn, I didn't know that, right? But you have to be able to be part of the fabric of the barbershop, right, in order to push people in that, right? You, you can't pretend that you're something else, right? If you are what you are, and I think it's important to just see yourself as part of that culture, right? But you also know that you need to contain it in the barbershop. You always have to pick your battles sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> for me, you right. know, for the same reason, you know, it, 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 it doesn't mean that you become unprincipled because I think that there are certain things I just won't allow said around me, certain things I won't allow done around me. But you also resist being that guy, right? Because once you become that guy in the barbershop, no one, no one takes you. Then you right. lose, then you lose whatever you have. So, so for me, it's, it's, it's a moral and ethical and political tightrope to always, you know, walk. Um, I, barbershop space. Uh, I found the spaces most challenging for me were fraternity culture, for sure, um, for the very same reason, right? Very, very homophobic, very hyper-masculine. Um, sexist. Sexist, I mean, all across the board. Other homosocial spaces like, um, <laughs> like the barbershop, and honestly also political, progressive, radical political organizing. It was the third space I found to be the most <laughs> patriarchal and homophobic in, in the spaces that I had to believe most regular, you know what I mean? But I, I and I'm police is the wrong word because that positions me a little bit. I, I need to be policed as well. I, mean, I don't mean that in a sense of moral authority, I just mean I was thoughtful about it. And I would try to pick my battles and find moments where we can have productive and healthy conversations about the language we use and about the choices we make, you know? And I think, honestly, um, there have been, and Jay Z talks about this in the code, you know, there, there are spaces where I think hip hop has actually allowed us to have better conversations, right? Like, 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 it's not cool to not take care of your kid. Like, hip-hop killed that, right? Like, nobody raps, yeah, I got three kids, don't see none of them, you know? Like, don't nobody care, you know what I mean? Like, you rap on a lot of ill shit, but that ain't one of them, you know? So, so I think that, but, but there are times when people say stuff like that, and people be like, yo, what you mean you don't see your kid? You know what I mean? So I think there is healthy uh, there. You know, sexual violence. You know, I think there's a way to have that conversation about about rape culture and also about what consent looks and sounds like. And a lot of times, when bros tell stories in the barbershop, but and that's sort of proxy for all other stuff. You you be like, dog, I don't think that's consent. You know, and you start to have that conversation.